Well, because this week begins our World Project Missions Conference, I wanted us to talk a little bit about the instruction of Jesus to the early church and the disciples, and he told them, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, we as a church, 87 years ago were formed, and this church for 87 years has decided and taken it to heart that that meant us, that we needed to find people in our church who would be willing to go and take the gospel to faraway places, to people we had never met, um, and, and we were gonna pray for them, and we were gonna pull out our money and support them, and because when, when God says that that's what the church is supposed to do, we really took it personally. We, it was our job. We were gonna do it. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says this. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. This is, this is what we're gonna look at today. This is the instruction. You know what, there are some people that need to go, there are some people that need to send them, and we all need to pray for this great effort because people need to be saved. That means that people don't start out saved. They get saved when they discover the truth of the gospel. Now, I'm so glad to be a part of a church that supports missionaries. We actually support, and we've got a slide for this, we actually support 173 missionaries. And, see the 173, it's right there. 173 missionaries every month. Now, so that you can kind of visualize what that's all about, I want us to roll the credits. Come on. This is what 173 missionaries and missionary projects looks like. I mean, you can see they're, in, they're all over the world. Mongolia, Springfield, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Germany, Brazil, Ecuador, Nicaragua, um, School of the Nations here in Ozark, Mana, Pakistan, Freeway, Cambodia, uh, we're planting churches all around America. But every single month, we are supporting this many missionaries. And how do we do that? Because the people in this church for 87 years have decided to give an offering to missions over and above our regular tithes because we want you to feel like it is your effort that you're doing this, that you are part of this team. And, the, and, the, and it goes on and on. 175, 173 uh, missionaries. Um, Cindy and I both have had the privilege of growing up in missionary families. Cindy went to the Philippines as a babe in arms on a freighter uh, many years ago. I shouldn't say many years ago, okay? Not too many years ago, but but a little bit many years ago, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, she's not here. Uh, um, <laughs> she's teaching Sunday school and can't be watching the live stream either, so I'm okay. Uh, my family went when I was a little boy. Uh, Cindy and I served as missionaries for 20 years. All five of our children, they counted a privilege that they got to be missionary kids. They were all born there, and over our, our time, we... We, we have watched God do some amazing things. For, and as we sit down around our dinner table, there are often times when we recall when God did this and supplied that. And when this person came to Christ, that didn't seem like he would ever believe or they would ever believe. And, and, and for us, when it comes to missions, missions is not abstract. Missions was like our life. It's what we did. It's how we lived. And, and that's, this church is a lot like that. And so I, I want to just go over Romans chapter 10, uh, three basic thoughts, and then that's going to be our message today. The first thing is this, that people need to be saved. You know, the first problem people have is they don't know they're lost. 
And yet, if they think about it, they know the death is coming, and when they realize the death is coming, that means that something's gonna happen after death, and people are born with this sense of eternity in their souls, and then there's this fear, and I need to be saved, and, and then there are many ideas out there about whether or not you need to be saved, how to be saved, what's the path to be saved, how good do you have to be to be saved? I mean, the discussions are endless. I remember one time I was in Singapore speaking at a church and I got in a taxi and I was traveling across the city and as I was uh, driving, we were driving, I saw this very large uh, temple in a compound and so I asked the taxi driver, so tell me, who, who is the God of that temple? And he responded, oh, there are many gods in that temple. I said, okay, but like who's the boss God of that temple? You know, he says, I don't know. He was lost. My neighbor in Manila was a great guy. He, was, he, was, he became a dear friend. He, he was from India, and he was Hindu. And one day I asked him, I said, Harish, can you tell me about your re religion? And he said, Ed, um, we have tens of thousands of gods in my religion. I don't understand my religion. If the elders call and tell me this is the day to fast, I fast. If they call and they say this is the day to feast, I feast. Um, I don't understand my religion. He was lost. I'll never forget standing beside a friend of mine who was the child of a missionary. Uh, his parents went to Korea right after the Korean War, and those were difficult times. Korea has changed immensely over the years, but at that particular time, um, it, it was it, there were primitive areas and villages, and and um, he said that he had been invited to go to Korea because they were going to be honoring his father. And um, he, he said, while I was there waiting for everything to begin, I was standing by a pastor who said, you know, your father came here. I remember he said, when I was a little boy, in my village, there was a large tree that we worshiped and the elders one day decided that they needed to sacrifice two young boys to the spirit of that tree. And he said, um, all of a sudden, as they selected the two young boys, uh, the word got out, and when they called everyone to assemble around the tree, he said, the missionary came up over the, over the hill, came walking down, went straight into the crowd. He scooped up both of those two young boys and he said, not today you're gonna sacrifice. And he, and he walked these boys up back out over the hill and saved them. Went, you, that is a courageous missionary. And then the pastor said to him, I was one of those boys. This is, this, is what, this is what goes on. You know, I grew up in a place where Christianity was well known, and even in America, many people understand the story of, of Christ and the gospel, but I don't know that everybody who understands it or hears it really gets it and understands, well, how do you be saved? I, I'll never forget the week my dad brought my brother and I up to this little uh, town about two hours from Manila, it was Holy Week, and this was the place where the men would, would cut their backs, beat their backs, it was a bloody parade of men beating their backs with bamboo whips, and um, at the end of the parade, out in the field, in the clearing, they would actually crucify people to a cross, and on that day, three men were gonna be crucified. And I'll never forget, I mean, you, you hear about this stuff, you can even see a photograph in the, in the paper, and, and I had grown up hearing about this, but this day I was right there, my shirt got bloodied because you, you can't be in that kind of a parade without the blood coming all over your shirt. Um, and uh, I remember standing watching them crucify three men. I began to ask the crowd, why, why are they doing this? One person said, oh, you know, that man in the middle, he, he has done this many years because he actually is a very bad man, but he pays for his sins every year. The only problem is that's not the story. You and I, sinful people, could never shed our blood 
Because if our blood was shed, it would only pay for what we owe. There's no rescue there. It was Jesus who came and paid for us. Salvation is a free gift. Isn't that good news? Salvation comes to all who call upon him. Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Do you hear that? His great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us together with Christ. By, by grace you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Wait, do you just see what happened there? He saved us now. He lifted us up and put us in the presence of God so that in the future you all have no idea. I have no idea what it's like for, to, to receive the, the riches of his kindness. I mean, we're, we live in an expectation of the goodness of God that is not yet displayed but is coming. And it goes on, that in the ages to come he might show the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the story of a good God. This is a story of a God who is full of compassion, who is merciful and forgiving. And we are lost and we are dead in our trespasses and sin. But God intervened in the person of his son Jesus in order for us to be saved. Jesus says, Give me your sin. I will pay for you. And then he died and rose again the third day. And this is the good news. This is how we get saved. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine to 10. This is the vision of God. He wants people to be saved from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So this is what missions is all about. Some people say that Christianity is so narrow. No, no I, don't, I, I think they misunderstand the story. I've talked to a lot of people with a lot of ideas and a lot of religious beliefs and a lot of confusion and a lot of insecurity and a lot of fear. And Jesus said, let me just make it simple for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. It's not exclusive, it is inclusive, it is simple. Here it is, it's for everyone, every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter end, of the, uh, end of the earth. We as followers of Jesus have been instructed to go to the end of the earth because people need to be saved. Number two, we, we need to share this message. We need to share this message. Jesus was gonna build his kingdom, but not like other people. He wasn't gonna use the conventional instruments of power, like weapons of war, political power, money, or even religion. The power of the Holy Spirit and his word in the lives of the people that had come to Christ would be themselves his secret weapon. I mean, we, the testimony of his people, the empowered witness of his people are what God has planned to use to reach people with the gospel of Jesus. You've got a story. You should always be telling your story whenever you can. Go tell the people what God did for you. Go tell people around you where your hope is. 
Go tell the people around you why you can hope for eternal life. What does the promises of God feel like to you? He stood up in this group and he said, this was just before he ascended into heaven, all right, here's the deal. It's gonna go on. You're the witness, go, go. Go to the end of the world. Now that is an assignment that will take your breath away. Where's the uttermost parts of the world? How do you get there from here? Who's gonna support this? How in the world do you com communicate the gospel when there are so many languages and, and customs and many different ways in this world? I mean, it's a scary world out there, would you agree? And yet our missionaries are called to go, we're, we're called to send them. I mean, <clears throat> they leave the comfort of their homeland and they go to people that they don't know. And, and you know, just from experience, and when that happens, it's amazing how the, the people that you didn't know become your people. And that becomes home as well. Start in Jerusalem and take the gospel wherever, wherever you can go. You know, we're coming up to Fall Fest and, you know, I'm reminded of a time, you know, when I, when I travel or I, I, I just always would love to be able to share the gospel with anybody who will listen. You know, you have to kind of gauge that because... If the person beside you puts in their ear, earplugs, uh, earphones, whatever they use, iPods, AirPods, some kind of pod that goes in their ear, uh, they probably don't want to talk to you, right? Sometimes people want to talk. I remember one time I was in, I was in an airport and uh, there was a couple next to me and I was talking to them. They were talkative and so I thought, well, let's talk about it. I brought up the topic of faith and they said, oh, well, you know what? I, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. He says, let me tell you how that happened. He said, my, my dad never went to church. We never went to church. But then one day, he got a mailer from this church. And unknown to him, his best friend received the same mailer. My dad, without talking to his best friend, decided that we were going to go to church that day. And when we got there... His best friend was there, and they discovered that they both had gotten the same mailer, and they both ended up at the church at the same time, and they heard the message of the gospel, and, and they came to faith, and now we, we go to church all the time. He went on to say, you know what? In, in my family, every Halloween, my, my family would pack um, bags of candy, because kids love candy. Did you know that kids love candy? <laughs> they, you know, adults love candy, too, I'm here to say, Okay. He said, and we would always pack a track, a little, a little a pamphlet that talked about the gospel. And one of the children said one day, Dad, why are we doing this? I mean, does this even matter? And he said, yes, it does. I talked to a man one time who said as a little boy, he got all of his Halloween candy, and like little kids will do, dumped all of the candy on the table and began eating the candy. And the, the, there was a piece of paper in there. It was a track that described the gospel. And because he had nothing else to do while he was eating candy, and that was the only only thing that wasn't edible, he began to read it. And he read the track, and it, it described that Jesus came to, to pay for our sins, and at the end of the track, there was a prayer you could pray if you wanted to be saved. And that boy prayed that prayer, and he said, my dad said, you never know who's gonna open up this candy and who's gonna read this. That's why we're doing this. Go and make disciples wherever you are. Do what you can. Tell your story. I think a lot of times we think, well, I, I don't think I should be the spokesman for the gospel because like, there's so much I don't know. Have you ever felt that way? What if people ask me questions I can't answer? I promise you they will, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm not perfect yet, so I don't know that I could be the spokesman. Yeah, you're not. You know, ne neither was Peter. I mean, he denied Christ three times, and then that's, after that he went and he preached a, a message at Pentecost, and thousands of people came to faith. You look at the lives of the, the, uh, the, uh, the disciples, they weren't perfect, they weren't complete, they, they were in process. Don't wait until you think you know everything. 
I think too many people, we, we sometimes think, I need a little bit more training. I, I, need, I need to know how to do this better than I know how to do it. And a lot of things in our life, you don't know how to do until you just do it. You know what I'm saying? You just got to go. You just got to try. Just got to muddle through. Now, one of the bravest things I've ever done in my life is paragliding off a Himalayan mountain in Nepal. And I promise every year I look for a sermon to insert this photograph so I want you to see it because this is the only time in my life when I was brave, okay? I am not the guy that wants to, you know, risk my life every time by jumping out of an airplane. Uh, I mean, really, I'm happy to stay inside the airplane and look out the window. I'm very content with that. Anyway, on this particular trip, a bunch of people were jumping off this Himalayan mountain and paragliding down to that lake you see beneath me. And I don't know what happened to me. At the last minute, I said, I'm going to do it. We get up to the top of this mountain. Let me just tell you how this goes. We get up to the top of this mountain, and I meet a guy with a backpack. I don't know how much English he knows. He knows a little bit, and we start talking, and he takes off the backpack, starts unfolding this apparatus, and there is the parachute paraglide part of that that you can't see in the picture. And, and, and then he straps it onto himself and unfolds the, the, the parachute part, And in front of his harness is this little tiny seat. And I was supposed to sit on that seat. And he strapped me to it. And he says, okay, like this. I'm going to say, run, and you run. Okay? Yes. And then I'm going to say, stop, you stop. Okay, got it. This is the training. And some, then I'm going to say, run. Run, 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 run to the sky. And you run to the sky. Unless I say, stop. Okay. So he straps me in. He says, run. He runs, I run. We're, we're, it's tandem. He says, run, 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 run to the sky. And we run and we both jump off this mountain. And, and then about a second later, I'm like looking down and coming to my senses. And I'm thinking, what in the world have I just done? This guy has no idea how unathletic I am. I was in that picture It was fascinating and terrifying at the same time. He says, "Uh, what do you want to do? I says, what do you mean? He says, you want me to go up higher? He says, no. No, 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 no. Because he can catch the, the air pockets or whatever, the wind pockets, and stay up for a long time. I said, "Uh, I want to take pictures and go down. Let's go down. And that's the story of my once brave moment. Not a lot of training. Sometimes people say, I don't think I can do this. And Jesus says, yeah, you can. I'm not leaving you. I promise to give you my power my presence, and my provision. You don't know everything, but I do. So let's just run, run, run to the sky. I'm flying, don't worry. That's why a church like ours in the middle of Missouri can believe that when we put our money in the offering plate every week and when we say to a missionary who's wanting to go somewhere, hey, we'll support you, that somehow God could use us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth.
We just believe. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call upon him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? we got to send them. And then this passage ends like this. It goes like this. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I mean, I don't know that we want to judge everybody's feet in the room. You know what I'm saying? But you know what, when I read this, you know what I, what I sense here is you all get going on this. And when you, when you think about it, the, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. To me, what this says is there will be stories to enjoy. Like one of the sweetest stories for me is the story of a guy that was in the church that I served at in the Philippines. His name was Efren Ariola. He had a wife and one daughter named Jennifer. I says, Efren, tell me about how you came to Christ. He says, well, he says, um, in my family, my wife was the first one who came to church and she got saved. And then my daughter came to church and she got saved. And I told my wife, I'm not going to church with you, no. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to hear anything from that church. And so he said, um, I resisted. But every Sunday when she would come home, I would find her Bible and I would open it up and I would read the notes she had taken from church. I did that Sunday after Sunday until one day uh, I decided I might go. But in, be, in between that, he says, I went up to the, to the cathedral to pray because I was not feeling well and I brought my young daughter Jennifer with me and I reached up and I touched the idol and I was praying to the idol, asking to be healed. And then I, I was rubbing myself with, with, you know, after touching the idol, because that's how you transfer the power. That's, that's what he's telling me. And then I, I, I reached up and I rubbed the idol one more time and I was, gonna, I was gonna touch my daughter. And when I reached down to touch my daughter, my young daughter goes, oops, dad, I don't need that anymore. I've accepted Jesus. He said, it so shook me up that I went to church and I too came to know Jesus as my Savior. Brother Ariola was one of my favorite deacons. You know why? He did all the counting. One Sunday, um, I said, Brother Early, you, you, you weren't here to count. He says, that's what, he says you know, um, someone gave me a number. I added 50 because more will come. I thought, have you been doing that every week? Yes. That's why he was my favorite deacon. We, we didn't continue that practice, but, you know, he was generous with his counting. One other time I went to Congo to visit a missionary that High Street supported by the name of Elmer Deal. He happened to be also a professor of mine when I was in Bible college. And um, we went to Lubumbashi, uh, Congo. It was a small, rough, backward city uh, in the southern part of the country. And Elmer Deal and his wife had been uh, there for more than 50 years. He, at this point, he was 80 years old, and he was driving us around this town. And it was rough, I'm telling you. It, it, you, you, you knew. And, and we were going to this pastor's meeting. And so I was with some other, I was the add-on, dig, the, the dignitaries were with me, but I was sort of like the added guest. So I was with them. And uh, we drive up to the front of this church where the meeting was gonna occur. And lining the sidewalk from the front door all the way to the curb where our vehicle was, was a row of pastors, a double row of pastors. We get out of the car, I'll never forget it. We get out of the car and we walk in between this double row of pastors and they're greeting us 
on both sides, all the way down, all the way down. And finally, when we get all the way to the front of the line, as we get ready to step over the threshold, the music starts, the choir sings, and all the pastors are clapping and they're dancing. You know how they do in Africa, okay? And we're in the middle of them and they escort us into the building, down to the front, up to where we were seated. It was one of the most exciting moments of my ministry, just to be there. And I wasn't even the dignitary, I was just with them. I remember sitting with Elmer Deal and um, I said to him one day, so Brother Deal, like how many pastors and churches have you, how many churches have you started? He said, oh, I don't know. I don't know, several hundred pastors and churches have been started and I said, well, like on a given Sunday, like how many people do you think are attending those churches? And he's like, ah, I don't keep track of that. Ah, somewhere around 30,000 people, 30,000 people. Look at these, look over at this white headed man who had given his life. And I said, Brother Deal, you've given your life to this place. Do you have any regrets? Without hesitation, he said, I regret only that I have only one life to give. I would do it all over again if I could. And we were a part of that story because we supported him those years while he was in Congo. He's in heaven now. But those churches continue. So this week, we're going to take the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and we're going to put it into action. We're going to hear from our missionaries, four of them, one, one missionary from London, uh, one is from um, Spain, one is from Uruguay, one is from Argentina. And that's going to happen Wednesday night. Please come. And then next Sunday, we're going to do as we do every year. Because this, this is how we intersect with the command of Jesus to go into all the world. And um, we're, going to, we're going to pray. And I, I want you to take this card with you. You know, the one thing I don't want to do is to be a salesman and convince you to give money. But as your pastor, I tell you that the best life would include being a part of the Great Commission by giving some money. People in this church give small and some give large, but everyone who takes a card and makes a commitment next Sunday will get a candle and we just will celebrate the fact that once again, this year we're gonna say to God, we're in. We're doing this. We, we're going we're gonna to proclaim the gospel to the world. So help us. Provide for us. Give us the money we promised. I promise you, he will. I want to invite you to stand, if you will, please. So take the card. Pray over it this week. Bring it back next week. And we will, uh, we will celebrate that we can be a part of the Great Commission. As you bow your heads today, I want to ask you the question. Maybe there's somebody here, and you would say, I'm actually pretty confused. I don't know. I don't feel secure that when I die, I would go to heaven. I don't feel saved. That same passage says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, how can it be so simple? You know, the only way it can be is simple. We can't do anything. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, who loves us so much, sent his son. And Jesus went to a cross and he paid. And then he rose again the third day. And he says, if, if you just come to me and ask me, I'll save you. Maybe you're here and you need to ask him to save you. Will you join me in prayer right now? Say, God in heaven, I, I want to be saved. 
don't fully understand everything, but I do know I would like to be forgiven of my sin. And I would like you to be a part of my life. I would, I'd like to give you my life. So Jesus, I surrender to you. I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to save me. And if you prayed that prayer, according to scripture, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that's you. And um, we're going to worship and sing together. And if there's something else we could pray with you about, I invite you to come. So um, you come.